Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to the talk tonight. It's lovely that you could be here, and, and we're very grateful for M Pavilion to have us on their uh, program this year. Uh, before we begin this evening, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri, on whose land we stand today, and also um, the traditional owners of any lands that any viewers might be standing on today that um, are not here with us except in a virtual context, and we pay our respects to their, to their uh, ancestors and their elders past, present and upcoming. Uh, it gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce my co-panellists, Amy Muir and Peter Williams, as part of this event. Uh, Amy Muir is an architect and director of Muir. She's a former president, oh, Victorian president of the Australian Institute of Architects, uh, and is currently a lecturer at, in, at RMIT as well. Amy is committed to establishing strong links between teaching, research, practice, and public advocacy. Uh, Peter Williams is, a found, is one of the founding directors of Williams Bogue Architects. The practice has won multiple state, national and international awards, including the 1994 Australian Institute of Architects Victorian Architecture Medal. Peter was also president of the Architects Accreditation Panel, uh, sorry, Accreditation Council of Australia from 1997 to 1999, a member of the Victorian Government's Design Review Panel from 2012 to 2015, and Chairman of the Architects Registration Board of Victoria from 1982 to 1997. He's also former Chair of the Australian Tapestry Workshop, and he instigated the Tapestry Design Prize for Architects in 2014, uh, a Australian Tapestry Workshop initiative that's rekindled interest in tapestry from within the architectural community, both locally and overseas. Please join me in welcoming Amy and Peter. This evening we'll explore a number of tapestry collaborations between artists, architects and tapestry weavers and discuss how approaches in this exciting medium enrich architectural contexts and what role contemporary tapestry might play in transforming private and public spaces into the future. There'll be an opportunity for questions at the end and we see this as a very informal uh, conversation about ideas about tapestry and public architecture. So, what is tapestry? Uh, the, official, the official definition is a, wef, a weft-faced weave with a discontinuous, sorry, a, a weft-faced weave with a continuous weft. The warp thread, uh, as I'll Come show you an hold. example. Thank you. You can do a show and tell. Uh, thank you. Uh, the warp threads are the vertical structural threads, which you can see in the, in the slide of the, uh, behind me. Uh, that are covered by the weft in an under and over uh, technique which completely covers the warp threads. Now, the threads are carried by a bobbin. So it's a, essentially a very simple technique, but um, incredibly complex when you get to the standard of our um, extraordinary weavers. So you carry a number of different threads um, on the bobbin, and we have a, a palette of 370 wool colours and 200 cotton colours, which gives our weavers extraordinary subtlety and depth and flexibility. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, there's a number of threads here. We can carry up to 13 threads on any, on any um, one bobbin. Uh, so, how is tapestry woven? Very, very slowly, uh, essentially. It's uh, very time consuming and we measure how much of a square metre per week a weaver can weave. The more complex uh, and finer the design, the longer it takes. And some tapestries can indeed take years to make very large tapestries. Uh, so, uh, you can see the weavers uh, in the slide behind me with a series of bobbins uh, that give them the subtlety to weave the very complex Justin Hill tapestry, which was the winner of the second tapestry design prize. And here we have these, these enormous looms which are beautifully engineered to ensure that the tapestries are as flat as possible and maintain their tensions. So tapestry is about design, structure, materials, texture, form, collaboration and teamwork. Very, very similar to architecture. Uh, 
the tapestries are, are woven on these uh, large looms and the artist weavers do all parts of the process. Uh, a question we are often asked is, um, are they paid or are they volunteers? They're highly trained, very professional artists. Uh, they do everything from warping up the loom, creating the experimental samples that will inform the final creative approach, selecting the palette, the texture, the fineness and thickness of the body of the tapestry, making the cartoon, which informs um, uh, the tapestry itself, the finishing off of the tapestry and the creation of the hanging system. Uh, we also have a specialist dyer on staff, which is extremely important for us to have quality, uh, quality control over our materials. Uh, just a brief run through of uh, tapestry. This is actually necessary because so many people get confused about what tapestry very, uh, is. The Bayeux tapestry is in fact an embroidery. Uh, so it's very important to distinguish the art of tapestry from uh, needlepoint or, uh, or embroidery. So tapestry has a very long and illustrious history and its golden age was during the medieval and the renaissance periods where tap the tapestry was at the top of any regal or any uh, noble uh, inventory. The tapestries came first. Uh, they were extremely costly pr to produce because they used to use often a lot of gold and silver thread, particularly for royal tapestries. Uh, it was all about power and presentation. So the great period of tapestries began in about 18, uh, sorry, 1350 when kings, nobility and churches patronised the large tapestry workshops in, uh, particularly in France and Belgium, to reflect their power, their prestige, their taste and their wealth. Royal patron, patrons in particular use tapestry to project their majesty and their magnificence. Uh, Henry VIII reputed, uh, reputedly commissioned a series of tapestries that cost more than a warship. I can assure you that our tapestries are much better value for money. But essentially, the tapestries were pictorial. They illustrated uh, biblical or mythological stories to, to really reinstate the power, the legitimacy and the magnificence of their owners. And it was also uh, about uh, essentially illustrating uh, important stories to a largely illiterate uh, audience. Uh, did you want to pop in there? Now, the, the tapestries behind me uh, are a magnificent series. And for, those, for when you can travel again, uh, if you haven't been to Angers, it's really, really such a magnificent centre of tapestry. There's these apocalypse tapestries that you can see on the slide, which um, were commissioned um, by Louis, the Duke of Anjou, Anjou, woven in Paris between 1377 and 1382. And they're in the chateau in Angers. And across the river is another beautiful museum by a much more contemporary uh, tapestry artist, uh, Jean Lussard. But we'll talk more about him a li little later. But this is the most magnificent series. And it's quite extraordinary, given the history of war within Europe um, over that period, that um, any of these tapestries survive. Uh, another famous series that you may have seen uh, are the Lady and the Unicorn series. They were on display in the Art Gallery of New South Wales several years ago, but they're, they're actually on, usually on permanent display at the Cluny Museum in Paris. And these are probably some of the most famous tapestries in the world and really quite extraordinary. We, uh, when I was uh, dealing with um, the, uh, uh, the board, and uh, that was a wonderful experience, I must say, we made great contact with the director of the Musée um, in Paris, the Musée de Cluny, and uh, I think we had really hoped that we might be able to talk Elizabeth into bringing France, one of France's national treasures, to uh, to the tapestry workshop in South in, in South Melbourne. Uh, security probably had a little bit of, a bit to do with her uh, negative response, but they did actually come in into Sydney in a very um, um, opportunistic um, opening where there was an exhibition space became available. I think she had to make a decision about uh, some renovation in uh, Paris and they came out here. And if you haven't seen them, they are really extraordinary. Um, and from the period that they date from, they are so enigmatic and puzzling and quirky 
and they are now that um, the decision was made to wash them, which I can't imagine how difficult that decision would have been to do as a curator, to wash those tapestries from the Middle Ages. Um, they are just vibrant and wonderful and there for another, you know, three or four hundred years. So, uh, they were gr they're great things and I uh, um, could heartily endorse looking at those as well as the Angers. Um, I can't talk about tapestries without mentioning Louis XIV, who uh, formed a very prestigious collection of around about 2,600 tapestries uh, in his collection, and he also established the prestigious Gobelins Manufactory in Paris uh, in 1662 to create uh, tapestries largely for royal use, and it is still weaving tapestries today. It's uh, entirely funded by the French government, who have a wonderful sense of patrimony, artistic patrimony in particular. But it was essentially uh, formed, um, formed, it's still in the same site where it was originally established, and when I was given a special tour there, there they said that tapestry looms are... Uh, uh, in exactly the same places that they were when Louis the 14th, in Louis the Fourteenth's time, and, it, and uh, compared to our our beautiful modern looms, it looked like they were the same looms. But uh, but interestingly, the French technique is that they actually weave from the back, um, which we don't understand because we just think, why would you create a degree of difficulty that's absolutely unnecessary? So um, so they weave looking into a mirror, whereas our weavers are constantly um, <laughs> look, uh, up at. Uh, looking at their tapestry and their work so they can evaluate how effectively their image making is working from um, close up, from mid distance and from long distance, which is incredibly interesting. However, our technique is very much the same except we work from the front. Uh, so essentially that is an extraordinary legacy that Louis XIV has left and uh, so many of those tapestries that you see throughout um, Europe are from those and from the Flemish workshops. Interestingly, the, the, uh, most of the tapestries in, uh, the, in the Vatican collections are also French. Interestingly, the Italians never really had any kind of tapestry workshops. And the British had, a ve they had the Mortlake tapestry workshops, which lasted a hundred or so years, I think. Uh, and there's a number of uh, uh, beautiful Mortlake tapestries in the major collections in, uh, in the UK. Uh, so tapestry as, a, as the premier art form re really lasted until the 17th century as tapestry was gradually overtaken in importance by uh, painting, by oil paintings, uh, which were much quicker and much easier to commission. Um, I just wanted to uh, add a little interesting sideline here um, in the tapestry um, uh, with the very elaborate border. Um, borders were often changed. Tapestry workshops um, had a sideline of repairing tapestries and, re and replacing borders. So, for example, if somebody um, lost a battle and lost a lot of their um, goods and chattels, particularly their tapestries, the winner would actually reweave um, the borders and replace the borders and put their own coat of arms on. So it was a really interesting sideline. So tapestries were quite mobile as, as, as images of power and propaganda. Uh, I think on that note, I think it was it was really interesting as well the way that they were taken as sort of tokens or acknowledgement of the battle, and taken back to their castle, and then having to reappropriate them as well. I mean, you're talking about you know the borders, but also if they didn't fit on a wall, um, rearranging and you know and cutting. I mean, they even talk about cutting. I think to fit within a new space and how do you reappropriate um, those conditions? But, you know, understanding that this is a token of acknowledgement of power um, is quite extraordinary, I think. And, and, and often because, uh, because uh, kings had so many residences and nobles had so many residences, the tapestries would travel before them. And so when they arrived, when they arrived with their entourage, the tapestries would already be hanging in the castle. And, and they formed a very important role both to keep out the cold, um, it's wonderful acoustic properties, and also decorative properties as well as their okay, so propaganda properties. Their, their um, magnificence and and um, and wealth and power, so they were they they were very multi-purpose art forms, but um, highly prized. Uh, interestingly, uh, Henry the Fourth had a number of tapestries, 
And Henry VIII was particularly very keen on tapestries and he was given uh, 800 tapestries that Cardinal Wolseley owned and he used to display them at Hampton Court and he used to have his staff change over his tapestries once a week. So, <laughs> nice if you can do it. <laughs> uh, then, so tapestry really fell by the wayside until uh, really... Uh, in the, the 1930s to 60s, where you had really influential people like Jean Lussard, who was a good friend of Picasso, and Braque and so on, and, um, and Miro and Matisse, uh, Man Ray and so on. And he essentially uh, revitalised the art of tapestry. And again, uh, his museum in the old hospital, in the old medieval hospital in Angers is, is not to be missed. It's really superb. And uh, so Jean Lussard and uh, Marie uh, Coutoli uh, uh, both commissioned and exhibited nationally and internationally um, a very wide range of tapestries by Le Corbusier, by Braque, by Miro, Picasso, Matisse, Man Ray, Leger and others. Um, and then on to really the 60s where and can 70s... I just, can I just add something oh. there, um, Antonia? The, it's interesting seeing that Lussard tapestry up there. There was a, an exhibition of uh, French tapestries um, in Melbourne in um, the late 60s, early 70s, and it followed a, a traditional tapestry exhibition. And it was really that, that, those two exhibitions that prompted um, the, um, the setting up of the tapestry workshop, the Victorian tapestry workshop by um, Dame Elizabeth Murdoch and uh, Lady Delacombe. They said, if uh, we, can, we can bring these things in here to see, we have wool here, we have artists, we can actually do it ourselves in this country. And that seeded the, uh, the thinking about um, starting the Victorian Tapestry Workshop, as it was then, uh, and it, they took it through to uh, um, government in, I think, 1976, and uh, the Tapestry Workshop was born. So it's very interesting that that... Uh, as, a, as a sort of counterpoint to a traditional tapestry uh, was the spark for kindling the contemporary tapestry workshop that we have now. Uh, Archie Brennan was a formidable artist, teacher uh, and um, general polymath uh, who, set, who was running the Dovecot Studios in Edinburgh for many years. And it was very much his, his view that the weavers were artists in their own right, um, other than in the, in, in the uh, traditional uh, workshops in France and in Belgium, they'd become very much the, the journeymen uh, and they didn't have a... Did, they'd uh, lost that really strong voice about uh, collaborating and having artistic input. Um, Archie was a, a very prodigious educator and a very passionate artist and he saw the, the weaver's role as being artist as central to the ethos of the, of the tapestry workshop. And he was brought out by the Victorian government to advise on the establishment of the Victorian tapestry workshop, now the Australian tapestry workshop. And that is very much at the centre of, of our being. Uh, now the Australian tapestry workshops had a very important relationship with architects right from the very beginning and um, essentially I'd like to ask Peter, um, as an architect you've been involved with tapestries and the ATW for a very long time, what essentially inspired your thinking behind the Tapestry Design Prize for Architects? Um, well, uh, it has been a long time and uh, it hasn't actually finished yet so I'm, I still have a, a great interest uh, from the uh, periphery but... Uh, I think one of the things that uh, inspired me to think about that was really just what would be the cohort that we could make contact with um, as an arts organisation. Arts organisations generally in this country struggle and um, there isn't the funding, there isn't the sort of patronage necessarily across the board. And so what I was concerned about is um, post-global financial crisis, um, very little money in the uh, pot, um, difficulties with um, paying salaries for weavers and buying materials and so on. How do we actually expand the areas we touch on? And it seemed to me that that's when the traditional connection, in my mind, uh, 
uh, with um, between architects and uh, and architectural space became apparent, and it was really thinking back about the time of Corb and Brack and um, Lassar and people like that who actually had a different sort of approach to tapestries and, uh, and uh, there were certainly notable installations both in this country and, ex and overseas that used tapestries for, um, uh, you know, a sort of um, uh, a, a component of the architectural space that was more than just another wall to hang it on. Um, and Corb was one of those um, great uh, artists, uh, architects who did that. And so I was interested in if we could actually touch on that um, connection between architects and space and textiles um, that goes back such a long time, but with an emphasis on contemporary architecture, um, that might actually give us a... Uh, um, a window into an opportunity for the future and, that, and it actually proved to work out that way uh, with the um, Tapestry Design, Design Prize now in, uh, in, four, in, in almost in its fourth iteration and it has gone from uh, um, just a little idea in South Melbourne that we talked about in the board to something which is now universally uh, uh, and internationally um, you know look forward to and supported so uh, that seemed to be, to me, tap into something which was a core part of my background as an architect, uh, growing up um, and studying in the 60s. We're still aware of people. People like Corb were still alive. Uh, the Opera House was being built. We were hearing Utzon speak. Um, and all those sorts of things just seemed to be a very really important um, a stream of consciousness, consciousness about what you might actually be able to do as an overlap with textile art and tapestries. And I just happened to be um, happily involved with the workshop and uh, we were able to, uh, to, to, to give it some teeth. I was, I was just going to add to that, having entered the competition, um, I think it was at the first... 2015, yes. 2015. And I think we were just talking about this before. The importance of the competition is to engage with the con with the conversation about, um, you know, tapestry in the realm of architecture and what the possibilities of that are. And I think that that's the success of this competition is about the conversation that has evolved as a result of that, yeah. which I think um, any good competition is is what allows that to happen. So I think that that's been a very worthwhile... I, I think the other um, distinctive thing about it is that um, the, the competition prize has always had a hypothetical site. Um, architects need to have some constraints on their thinking and uh, respond to various uh, um, uh, pragmatic requirements and it seemed to actually just put it out as a design without any anchor of the site um, tended to make it not architectural, you know, the place was very important. And then it, it, it left it open to architects to think about, well, what do I do with this challenge of making a, uh, uh, a textile that probably none of them have ever thought about before um, for a hypothetical space? And we had some absolutely wonderful uh, suggestions and responses to it. And I think that's one of the things that architects do extremely well. They synthesise complex variables and actually make, uh, make outcomes. And uh, I think that's probably why we've seen the success we have in the, um, in, 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 in the prize. And Amy's uh, uh, just said that the, uh, the context of um, thinking about the textile in relation to space and then um, how you might actually construct uh, an idea into a textile is a really interesting thing. Can I throw it over to you both? Um, what are some of your favourite examples of architects working with uh, tapestry? And and Corb is a very good example. Did you want to talk more about that and others? Uh, Corb is is an extraordinary um, architect, uh, artist, and uh, writer, and theorist, and all those other sorts of things. And um, the uh, uh, the work that he's produced is extraordinary. I think he did something about like 27 or 32 tapestry designs in his work 
And one of the ones that um, I found absolutely fascinating is the, uh, the Shandigar High Court building in the, um, the capital, uh, Punjabi capital. So there's the assembly building, there's the high courts, and um, the, um, the, there were eight courts in the high court buildings, um, various size courts, and each one of those had a tapestry design for it. And uh, he certainly, and Antonia might have the quote there, I think, uh, certainly saw them as important acoustic uh, war elements in each of those courts, uh, the courtrooms. And um, luckily, we visited India a little while back and we had a very persuasive guide and I still had my card as chairman of the Australian Tapestry Workshop and we got through the Chandigarh administration and I got into those courtrooms and I could not believe it um, that there we were looking at those things and in the, uh, uh, the state of um, repair of them was absolutely saddening. Um, they had ducts cut through them, there were holes for vents, there were, they were folded back and clipped and cut. Um, and interestingly, in um, one of the books I was reading about, uh, the, uh, the tapestries uh, written by an Indian, um, there, a lot of the High Court judges were not actually impressed by these colourful additions to their courtrooms and they were saying that they thought that uh, the uh, inclusion of these were not actually responding respectfully to the law and the gravity of the law and some of them were actually removed and taken out for a while. So, I mean, uh, we often talk about integrating textile and art into a certain space. Well, there, were, there was a great example of it, uh, and uh, the judges actually took exception to it. So uh, it, it's fascinating. It takes a whole lot of different, uh, different talks. But I think one of the things that I loved about that High Court building is that there's an indication on the outside of the building with uh, three coloured columns, the main pillars on the entry, uh, that actually give you a sense of continuity and lead you into the idea of the colours in the, in, the, in the workshops. It's quite different to have a sort of austere building and go in and be confronted by a tapestry which is very colourful, but this actually has an inclination. It seems to be connected with the totality of the building rather than a wall decoration. And I think that's, that's really very interesting. So they're, they're great works. And of course, the other one that uh, is, um, is, is a bit sort of um, hair on the back of your neck standing up is the Utsum Tapestry, mm. the homage to Bark in, uh, in Sydney. We launched the Tapestry de Design Prize in Australia in front of that tapestry. And um, there's a great connection between that tapestry and the um, Australian Tapestry Workshop. One of our weavers actually went to um, Mallorca uh, with Utsun and finally um, decided on the colour balance and um, suggested the use of a gold thread, which Utsun hadn't a thought of, um, and that actually makes that tapestry just sing on the wall. And uh, so it, it, it's, about, it's, it's about collaboration, it's about uh, great... Um, technical skills and sort of conceptual skills coming together to actually produce something. So they're probably two of my favourites, really, uh, on, on, on the, the sort of international stage of tapestries. Uh, did, did, you, did you go to South America and see some of Burley Marx's work? Uh, we didn't. We saw some Burley Marx's work. We didn't see the tapestries, unfortunately. I mean, I was just going to touch on a couple of those things that you're talking about as well. And I think, you know, when um, we talk about... Um, modernist buildings as well, and going back historically, talking about the concept of um, the nomadic condition that tapestries had, and the the ability for them to, you know, be rolled up, taken to the next place, and reassembled to define a place, but also acknowledgement of where it might have come from. And I think that there's this, um, you know. Peter, what you're reflecting on, upon, you know, the, the pushback from having a tapestry as a, um, as a uh, form of ornament that had a relationship to the architecture that it was sitting within, um, but it had an acoustic quality as well. And the fact that there was, you know, um, pushback in regards to that within such an austere environment 
sort of talks to the psychology that we're currently sort of dealing with in architecture when we talk about law courts and how do we actually yes, how do we actually make these places um, spaces that people feel at ease, not on edge? How yes. do we allow for people to um, be within these environments and not to have the anxiety that comes with those spaces historically? Yes. And so I think, you know, there's something really interesting in the way that history sort of plays out and how we sort of go back again and, and revisit that. And I think, you know, Corb's obviously the relationship of architecture to tapestry is, is really important. But then when we talk about sort of, you know, these, um, these large scale tapestries and how they transform these spaces um, and the ability to put another one on, you know, the fact that the architecture does one thing and then the tapestry works with that architecture to bring another condition to that space, I think is really fascinating. And, you know, and, and the ability, it's not necessarily um, the way that we apply art, it's a very different thing. And I think the acoustic qualities that they bring to spaces um, af affects the way that we would then respond to that space. Mm. And it's not just through a visual image condition. I think it's the acoustic qualities, but I think it's also the sort of tactile nature yeah. of it. And the oh, fact very that much you can so, actually... Yeah. Uh, um, th there's a sense about a textile that um, is quite different to a painted surface or a tiled surface or anything else. Mm. And I think that does actually come across. And you have a look at some of those really sculptural um, uh, textiles that, in the, uh, that are in, uh, in Barcelona in the Miro exhibition. You know, they're really big lumpy things. Um, and they do something quite differently to your appreciation of the object that you're looking at, really. So... Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's an absolutely seductive uh, thing, and and the thing that I like about it is when you look at them, you can still see the structure. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you, you you actually know what holds it together, mm -hmm. and I think that's a really important thing. And if if you're an architect, you you really need to know what holds it together, and it's reassuring to know that you do know what's holding mm -hmm. it together. <laughs> and I think just on that comment, you know, yeah. looking at this sample again, I mean, I think that the fascinating thing is when we talk about structure, the fact that we have the, the extraordinary detail and craftsmanship that's put into the front face, but the back face tells the story, yes. exactly what you're saying, Peter, of this extraordinary other story that we understand the construction method for this. And I think, yeah, it's, it's quite unique in that regard. Yeah. Uh, talking of cutting holes in tapestries, <laughs> <laughs> the Arthur Boyd in Parliament House in Canberra is our biggest tapestry ever made and uh, one that causes, still causes controversy. People keep asking us why did they cut a hole in it to, uh, for the doors. The doors. Uh, uh, it was actually designed that way. Uh, Aldo Jurgler was very keen to engage uh, Arthur Boyd to create um, a monumental tapestry for that space for all of those qualities that we talked about before and that was, we for a number of different reasons, it was decided to make the tapestry in four different panels just because of the scale. It would have been too difficult and too dangerous to try and install it in four pieces. So it's essentially done in four different uh, strips and then Velcroed together. And it's really impossible to tell that in fact it, it is Velcroed, but it's quite an extraordinary tapestry and Took a, took 11 weavers, 22,000 hours to make over two years. An extraordinary piece. Extraordinary piece. I, I was very worried about the cutout, I must say, for the doors. <laughs> uh, I still am worried about well it. Well before my time. But if you have a look at the drawing that Corb did for the tapestry in the assembly building, he actually <laughs> labels a door and a bridge coming through the tapestry. So I guess it's okay. <laughs> Uh, just to, uh, to move on to our Tapestry Design Prize, because we're about to launch our fourth Tapestry Design Prize uh, in a couple of months' time, COVID permitting. Uh, we're planning to launch it in Brisbane as part of the, uh, uh, the Australia Pacific Architecture Forum in Brisbane. So, uh, fingers and toes crossed that we can actually get across the border. Uh, but uh, we 
we started the Tapestry Design Prize and um, there was joint winners uh, for, the, for the first prize and we were able, through, through the generosity of, and the vision, I should say, of Judith Nielsen from White, White, White Rabbit Gallery in Sydney to commission um, uh, John's design for her soon-to-be Phoenix Gallery, which John co-designed. Uh, there was a really lovely connection that came out of this and it, uh, that was very, very special to us. One of the reasons that Judith decided to commission this tapestry was that tapestry actually meant a lot to her father. After the Second World War, he was rehabilitated to Alexandria and as part of his repatriation program, he was taught to weave tapestries and tapestry remained, that love of tapestry and the making of tapestry remained with him his whole life. So for us, that gave an added dimension to the whole uh, process of tapestry. Uh, what particularly came out during this process was that, uh, that this example of this weaving this particular design showed that this, uh, it, the tapestry was some, uh, greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, essentially, John found that John saw his design as being essentially all about planes and light. And um, our weavers uh, bought something new to it. We d did a range of samples, and I encourage you to come and visit to the, ta the tapestry workshop in South Melbourne if you haven't yet been, because we've got all these on display and you can make sense of uh, what I'm saying. But we, we looked at all different warp sets, um, thick and thin, and different colour ranges and so on. And the weavers actually picked up the design had a pixelation in it. Um, and so they actually did some samples with this pixelation in it. And John said, what are you doing this for? And they said, well, have, actually have a look at your design. This is what we've picked up. He was absolutely delighted. And it became greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, and interestingly, he's got very good powers of persuasion, John, because the, as the design was progressing to the top, he decided that it actually needed to be another... Oh, uh, another 150 centimetres longer uh, than the design to give it a sense of um, far greater depth. And in fact, uh, he did bully me into it and we did have the capacity to do it and he was absolutely right. It has the most incredible sense. Now, that's the winning design. Um, just add another... another um... And the client was happy to pay. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> So, uh, so we were, we're, they were involved in the process all the way along in looking at all the different samples and um, helping make that decision, that collective decision about which samples, which techniques and which palettes would best uh, realise the combined artistic vision. So John was absolutely thrilled about the whole process. I remember the, uh, the cutting off ceremony and John talking about the, um, the tapestry and prior to whole issue of perspective and planes and so on, he, he actually said that he spoke to uh, a, um, uh, an attendant in a, um, a Renaissance theatre in Italy um, and uh, it was about building the, uh, the sets and using perspective as an illusion on the stage that actually inspired him to do that. And I thought to myself, um, this is probably the first time that tapestry has been talked about in the, in the workshop in this way uh, because it was archie speak. It was architects talking about uh, exploring the plain, um, talking about uh, some sort of uh, rationalising a sort of mysterious process and bring it to the fore. And I thought that was really great and I had hoped that um, that would be the first of many conversations that we had as a, as a result of the Tapestry Prize. And if you don't mind me jumping on to the, the second winner, um, when we talked about the, um, this wonderful tapestry um, by um, uh, Timothy Hill. Uh, sorry? Justin. Justin Hill. Um, he... Um, talked about his tapestry and it was the sort of antithesis of intellectual narrative. It was about intense human experience living in this place in Singapore. And uh, it, it was wonderful, really. And I thought that we were hearing uh, terrific 
stories and narratives um, and what were the drivers that made these people um, put together their tapestry concepts. And that seems to me to be a really strong point uh, that comes out of the Tapestry Prize. This, this particular design too I thought was really interesting because uh, when Justin's not being an architect, he's actually uh, a, a, a designer for theatre and opera and he has his own company in Singapore and a number of his, his, his um, sets have been um, seen all around the world, Edinburgh Festival and so on. And I think if you look very closely at this, you can see that sense of illusion that comes with theatre design as well as through architecture. So it was quite extraordinary uh, the, and the way that he envisaged his old black and white historic house in Singapore with those uh, beautiful uh, black and white cane blinds. And you can, if, you can see if you look at the design that some of the lining um, has fallen away. So there's only some lining at the top on the on the left-hand side and the rest of it, the rest of the lining has gone, so you can look through into his old, into his old black and white house and see the structure of the house behind. So it, it's extraordinarily three-dimensional, this work. It's, uh, it's really captivating and, and having lived with this work for a number of years now, one is constantly finding um, new aspects to this work, which is constantly intriguing. The winner of the third Tapestry Design Prize uh, for Architects was, uh, uh, was unfortunately not made. It, it's a really fabulous work called Chaos and Fertility by Pop, Pop Architecture and the Hotham Street Ladies. And it was designed very cheekily to wrap around the James, the James Turrell sculpture at Mona because uh, Mona was our site uh, for the prize and David... Uh, David Walsh said he could on, we could only use Mona as a site if he was if he could write um, write the um, the brief for the tapestry design prize. So I thought, well, we better hold on to our hats and see where we go. But it was a fabulous journey. But um, uh, when we actually announced the winners, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we uh, took. Um, uh, Nanda Katz led us in to have a look at uh, have a look at this, and he was he couldn't quite work it out. And I said it was done like a it was designed with a cater map in mind, so you could actually wrap it around the Turell. And he was absolutely horrified that we could desecrate that, that they would think of desecrating the Turell in this way, which of course ex is exactly what they were doing. They're being terribly naughty, but it's uh, it really to work. It needs to be done on a mon monumental scale, and it would require a monumental budget. So we haven't managed to find. Um, a suitable uh, person to commission that yet. Here's some of the experimental samples because they were very keen to look at texture and having have very three-dimensional pile around it and make it very, very interesting. And these are some of the uh, winners from the first, uh, the finalists from the first prize and I might throw over to you. Amy, and uh, as to what really motivated you and what was what aspects of what what intrigued you about the design process and your yeah, design? Yeah, I, I think I mean as I was saying before um, with Peter, just in I think what um, was really great about this competition was the ability to sort of understand its context from a historical perspective, and um, and I think that that's what was uh, you know a lovely part was the research. Um, into where it, where tapestry might sit now, based on um, the historical context, and I think that this was. Um, I'm just trying to. The pavilion was under construction at the yes. time. Yeah. So this is um, DCM's. The site was DCM's um, pavilion in Venice um, at the um, the site um, where the Biennale um, is held each year. And that building is a, um, a, a square in form and square internally as well and then has a, a central oculus. And so that was basically the prescribed site for this work. And I think, I mean, as architects and as the previous winner that you were sort of talking about, I think we inherently struggle, I do, I know I inter inherently struggle not thinking in three dimensions. And so this became an opportunity to once again reflect upon the, um, the notion of 
the tapestry being something that was nomadic and could be um, taken to places to then redefine space or place. And so we use this as an opportunity to once again talk about the craftsmanship associated with tapestry and also the idea that, you know, tapestry um, at a time um, in the medieval times also used gold and, you know, wove in these extraordinary kind of... Um, jewel-like uh, materials that were essentially talking about the richness and opulence um, of the tapestry at the time. And so I think we, we talked about it as being a very simplistic, you know, corrugated iron um, interior, and it was quite literally, um, this is the one that you could very vaguely on the right, left-hand side, but it was a circular space, and the idea that you could enter that space, and it was a, a corrugated um, interior. Um, so talking about, you know, that sort of very Australian material, but bringing in the, the sort of the, the gold um, colours and the richness of that, but also talking about the, the construction and the fact that in architecture we're sort of, you know, in car parks we see what this building, how it is made and what it is. And so the lovely thing that we were also keen to celebrate as well was the back face of the, the tapestry, which typically we don't see or isn't revealed. And so that became sort of almost an interior. So there were sort of two sides to this and, um, and really thinking about understanding how we understood this, the structure um, that this was. But that, that oculus basically was celebrated through tapestry and, you know, making a place, a space through a, a hung tapestry. This is just some examples of the extraordinary responses we got to the various briefs. It's extremely challenging for us uh, to look at how we can realise some of these extraordinary, extraordinary challenges, for lack of a better word. And uh, this is our last slide, which is an appropriate one to finish the slides on, uh, because this is the Corb tapestry that has found its way back to, well, back to the Sydney Opera House uh, for which it was intended. It was... Uh, the idea was to have the, that Utzon was very keen to have a Corb tapestry in the Opera House, and Corb, uh, uh, who usually said no, actually said yes on this particular occasion because he was uh, he was so enthralled by the whole concept. And uh, then things turned very pear shaped with the Opera House, and they were not interested in the tapestry and. Utzon went back to Denmark, and this stayed on his dining room wall. And uh, the children, his children, talk about uh, hiding behind the tapestry. And <laughs> indeed, uh, when it was conserved in Sydney, but prior to going to the Opera House, there was also <laughs> all sorts of food stuff still found <laughs> on the tapestry. So it was very much a family tapestry. Uh, but what what uh, is really exciting for us is that somewhere like the Sydney Opera House, who has our beautiful Utzon tapestry in the Utzon room. And if you haven't been to that room in the Opera House, do make sure you go there because it really is the most superb room. On one side, you've got the tapestry. On the other side, you've got Sydney Harbour. Um, Utzon absolutely uh, conceived of that as an acoustic panel as well as a decorative panel. And it really is superb. Uh, but this tapestry has now come back to the Opera House, courtesy of some extraordinary donors. And of course, they're the magnificent tapestries that were woven in France, uh, designed by John Coburn for the theatres in the Opera House, which are absolutely magnificent. They hung them especially as a once-off, it wouldn't be last year because that was a non-year, the year before. And, and they just hung them for one night and they were utterly, utterly superb. But uh, one of the criticisms was, a bit like the judges, really, in, in Chandigarh, uh, a lot of the designers for the uh, plays at the Opera House or the productions at the Opera House felt that these curtains were far too strong and far too much competition for their designs. So uh, there was pressure uh, on the Opera House to take them down and they remained in storage for many, many years. But they come out now on special occasions. Uh, they actually are not fit to be structurally fit to be um, hung all the time because they're so big they were actually one, uh, woven on their sides, which means 
the, the warp threads, um, which essentially take the weight of the tapestry, um, are on their sides. And so essentially over time, the weight of these tapestries is so huge that it, it'll start to split and to distort. So they, uh, if you ever get a chance, if they ever have a special hanging of them, do take advantage of going to have a look at them because they are utterly magnificent in the, in the Opera House. Um, it's, probably a, it's probably a good time, unless you had any more things you wanted to say to throw it open to questions. Um, maybe to prompt a question, um, I was thinking uh, when the title for the um, talk came up, which is Preserving Contemporary Tapestry Through Architecture, I thought that's a bit onerous for architects, really. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a big gig to look after contemporary tapestry via architecture. And um, so I wondered um, what, you know, what, where do we fit into this role? Um, and I think the Tapestry Design Prize hints at how we might fit into that. But I then started to think about what's the difference between, say, traditional tapestry, you know, from the 1500s or the 1600s, um, and contemporary work by Corb and Utzon and so on. And I got down to the position of thinking that it's probably about the intent of the work. Uh, you know, why is the work happening? And if, in the case of Louis XIV, it's happening for aggrandizement, and um, it's all about moi. And, um, it, you know, they there to um, maintain a sort of a, a standard um, of uh, existence that, that the ego is looking for there. Um, in contemporary tapestry, in the case of Woodson, for example, procuring a work, it's really about thinking about the space particularly as a sort of a... Uh, an involved person but not involved person. There's an objective view about what they're trying to do with um, the space, what he was trying to do with the space, the same with Corb and the same with, um, with uh, many other tapestries that are integrated. So I think it's about intent and I think if architects are uh, in there, architects are professionally detached from ownership of the building and the fabric that they're building and maybe the recommendations they might be making for inclusion. So I think there's a, there's a, um, a, a much more fluid ability to uh, advocate for tapestries in contemporary than there was in medieval times or the heyday of tapestry. Just a thought. Uh, just to add to what Peter was saying, uh, Corb's initial concept about the tapestries in the High Court uh, were, was, and was that um, different weavers from different villages across India would each weave a tapestry. So essentially it was reflecting and celebrating uh, the talent uh, of skills of the textile artists in India. Uh, that didn't get past that didn't get past the start line, and in the end, um, a, a, a one firm made made the lot, but it was a it was a, a lovely concept, which is a very long, long way away from the original uh, prestigious royal tapestry manufactories, uh, where they were actually celebrating the the extraordinary skills in India. So I think there's still room, very much, for those uh, that concept to continue. I, I was just going. I mean, I was thinking about what's the future of you know tapestry, or how do we how do we sort of comprehend this? And I always sort of think about the, the ability that tapestries historically were a narrative and a device for Absolutely. communicating a narrative and how do you then retranslate that or understand that. And particularly in Australia, I think we have the propensity through architecture in our cities and our built environment to erase very quickly. We're, we're, um, we, we're very good at doing that and we have no qualms about doing that. And so how do we sort of document or understand the narrative of our cities and, and the evolution of this and just, you know, propositionally, do we see the tapestry as, an, as, the, um, as a tool for capturing these narratives and, and re-employing the, the tapestry as a, a way of using its traditional methods or traditional um, means for doing that? Anyway. I don't know. The decision to proceed <laughs> with a tapestry is really charged because they're so expensive. It takes a long time and you have to see them as assets. 
not necessarily as a set of prints that you put in the corridor in a hotel lobby, you know. Uh, it's a different sort of engagement with the work. And I think that makes them much more powerful and um, it gives them longevity and uh, uh, a sort of connection with the, uh, the author and the commissioner and the weavers where the magic happens, um, which is profound, really. And I think, I think that thing about longevity is really... That's one of the most imperative things about it as a... Um, not only as a form of collaboration, um, but also uh, how it then lives on. Yes. And I think that that's what's really powerful about them. Yeah. Does any, would anyone like to ask our illustrious panel any questions? Yeah, not so much a question, but like just a bizarre uh, proposition. Um, so you spoke about the medieval uh, tapestry and how it was always relocated and reappropriated, re and then you also spoke about carb and how you don't you didn't really have access to seeing it, and when you did, it was like in in shambles, and the people out there didn't really appreciate it. In a bizarre hypothetical sort of scenario, it would be interesting to see if. Cobb's iconic work was relocated and re uh, reappropriated in a space in that iconic modernist building, what would it do? Uh, I did read recently that uh, there, there's a, an enormous push to have them recognised um, by UNESCO as iconic pieces uh, designed specifically for, for that site and that there's moves afoot to have them all preserved and put back in situ. So, I have fingers and toes crossed that such important works are looked after. Then, then of course, uh, there's, it, people have more access to them because presumably when the courts aren't being occupied for trials that you can actually uh, get access to the courts. I don't know. I haven't been lucky enough to go to Chandrigarh yet. <laughs> but uh, to me, to me what, I, what I really liked about what he was trying to do was the fact that... Um, the courts should be about openness and transparency um, of the law, not this sense of what the original judges appeared to have had. This, you know, it's the, it's the might of the law and the power of the law. It um, what he was trying to do was instill an entirely different vision of what the law could be in, in upholding the values of the new India. Uh, so... Yeah, the, the symbols in the tapestries really were things like rudimentary scales of justice, you know, the hand, um, uh, ebb and flow of, of, of water, rising sun, yin and yang, those sorts of things. So it was really trying to deal with um, how um, uh, decisions need to be made within a legal context. And I think they, they're very valuable from that point of view. And they would be wonderful if they were available and there was some uh, uh, explanation for uh, lay people to understand just exactly what it is there. Uh, perhaps not written by judges. Okay. Oh, hello. I'd just like to know what happened to the beautiful piece of tapestry that was cut away to fit the doors. I, well, I, I, I think if you if you look if you looked at the wall, um, you can actually see that it was probably cut and folded back, so it wasn't cut out and turned into a car rug or a dog, a dog kennel mat. Uh, it was actually um, folded back, and there is a photograph in, in that set that uh, um, Antonia had up. I think one of them might actually have uh, a corner of the tapestry rolled back and pinned because it probably impinged with people scuffing past it with books. So I, I, I don't think it's a discard but it's, it's badly chopped. Thank you. Oh. Hi, thanks for the talk. It's been really fascinating. Um, I, I was really interested in the, um, the suite of Utzon tapestries or the tapestries that Utzon commissioned prior to, um, well, at the time of, I take it, at the time of construction of the, of the Opera House. Um, and this, they obviously predated the Victorian tapestry workshop, so they would have been made in Europe. But... Um, to be honest, I wasn't aware that that suite of tapestries, tapestries existed, but how many are there? And 
um, were they in fact um, commissioned or made at the time of construction? I can't answer that because um, I, I don't know. Peter, would you know? Um, the, certainly he d dealt directly with uh, Corb on that tapestry, which um, he, he was wanting to get that in. It was not something that the actual tapest that, that the Sydney Opera House commissioned. Uh, so I don't know where they are and how many there are. Um, I will look that up. Uh, but uh, certainly the tapestry that we wove uh, from his design was when he re-engaged with the Opera House, so when Richard Johnson uh, took over that, that redevelopment. And uh, he said he went with trepidation to talk to to him about that and, and asked if he w wanted to design a piece of furniture very much like Corb or, uh, or, or, a, or an artwork or something as part of the celebration of the building. And he, he said, well, actually, and came out with the tapestry design, which he had um, already waiting. So he had designed um, some time ago. So th that was a very special commission for us. And it's probably one of my favourites. Not, not that I'm allowed to confess to having very many, but um, that, that is very, very special. Uh, but um, I'm sorry, I can't really answer that one. Oh, thank you. Um, we were actually in France last year and we saw the Dame de l'Ecron um, in Paris and we also went to the Chateau d'Angers and saw um, the suite of um, tapestry, in English, tapestries, and um, that was really quite special. So. It's really interesting to hear your perspective of that. Um, my question is, what would be the process of commissioning a piece um, of tapestry for um, architects? For example, um, a small architecture studio, um, we might have residential clients or we might have, um, I don't know, a commercial building that we would see a tapestry work. What would be the process of commissioning well, essentially, is it's com coming to meet with us and... Uh, oh, sorry, us, the Tapestry Workshop in South Melbourne. We're based in Park Street, South Melbourne. So it's a case of um, we, can, we can cost a tapestry uh, once we have a design. Otherwise, it's like saying how much does it cost to build a house? You know, it's as, it's as big or as small as you want it to be. It's as complex or as simple as you want to be, and it all depends on detailing and, and materials and so on. So uh, it's coming to the workshop, and uh, we discuss it with the weavers, and they look at the difficulty or the ease of which they could make it and the materials that would be used. And uh, then we can give you a quotation. And uh, if you are the client wants to proceed, then um, we... Get going. What's your sort of timeline? In, what's your sort of timeline in terms of a piece being from the start to the finish for a, a small piece, for example? Or Ooh, if that, that again, might be really again, unhelpful to again, us. Again, it depends on the design. But um, um, I hope you're not in a rush because at the moment, <laughs> at the moment, we've um, our books are full until we, we think our books are going to be full until next year. Uh, but uh, so essentially a piece like could take a couple of months uh, because it's, 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 it's very, very time consuming and the weavers are constantly winding bobbins to get the different colour shifts and so on. And so um, a, a weaver, we work, we work on a weaving rate and a weaving rate is how much of a square metre a weaver can work in a week. If it's very complex, it might be that much. If it's, if it's a very um, simple, uh, easy design like the Jorn Utzen design, well, a weaver could do so much in a week. So it's an, it, it, every, every project is different. But come down and have a look at the workshop anyway and meet the team and see what work we do. We'd love to show you. Uh, anyway, look, just to talking about the Tapestry Design Prize for Architects, we, as I mentioned before, we're going to be launching it in, uh, in the Asia-Pacific Architecture Forum in Brisbane on the 20th of March. Our judges this year are Cameron Bruin, Brooke Andrew, Diane Jones, Valerie Kirk, Dimity Walker and John Wardle. So we've got a wonderful selection of very talented national artists and architects. The first prize is $1,000 and uh, 
and there will be a $1,000 People's Choice Award. Uh, this year we have a really wonderful sponsor, Metal Manufacturers Limited, is excited by our prize and is keen to sponsor it over the next six years, uh, which is fabulous, as, as is the support of Architecture Media, Creative Victoria and the City of Port Phillip. But as tonight's event draws to a close, I'd like to thank Amy and Peter very much for their wonderful insights and the M Pavilion team for their assistance in delivering this program. And if you're interested in finding out more about the Australian Tapestry Workshop or, or the Tapestry Design Pliers for Architects, please have a look at our website. We encourage you to visit the website, and which is actually the, probably the very last slide. Um, anyway, you'll find us on um, Google. And thank you very much for attending tonight. Thank you. Thank you.